What are blue zones? And also, what did you learn from living in one? What do you think are the top three foods that people need to stop putting into their bodies? How important is hydration? What kind of water should people be drinking and how much of it? Why does the, the spirit or source want to experience limitation? Get it. I've been waiting for this, Let's bro. Go. <laughs> All right, so we already sweating. I think I, I think I'm beating you actually. A little I don't. Bit. I don't think so, bro. You don't think so? Yeah, that's all beads right there. I think we do. That's all beads <laughs> right there, bro. Look at that. I'm beating up everywhere, bro. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're in this sauna. I'm so happy that you 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 came by. You're yeah. you're in Atlanta. You came through LA for a day to jump in the sauna and chat with me. I'm I'm privileged. I've been a fan of your work forever. Yeah. Vegetation over medic. Like your books is are just on another level. I appreciate it, brother. Your content is on another level. You walk the talk. I'm gonna just say that. It's a lot of doctors, it's a lot of people that are content producers, but they don't live it. Like you, I feel like you live it. You have a farm, you 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 got your hands in the dirt, you know about the fruits, the tree. Like you you live it. You walk, you literally walk the talk. Yeah. So I just want to ask you first, because you're you're an expert in health, nutrition, obviously exercise, you look great. Let's talk about food. Let's yeah. jump into food. What would you say? And I know there's many foods that we should be putting into our bodies, but what do you think are the top three foods that people need to stop putting into their bodies? Oils. Mm. I, I know that's controversial yeah. because people are always saying you need healthy fats and you do need healthy fats, mm. but you don't need oils. Mm. You do need healthy fats, but you don't need oils. Okay. And we consume far too much oil. Okay. And what I always explain to people is this: it's the same with sugar. It's like you won't find a sugar tree, a sugar bush. Mm. It's always in something that has to be pulled out. Mm. And it's the same thing with oils too. It's always pulled out of something. It's pulled out of an olive. Mm. It's pulled out of an avocado. Mm. Or it's created in a lab and we call it canola oil. And so once you extract something out of nature, it doesn't have its full potential anymore. Mm. And now it's become doubled up. And so I would say oils and- uh, Well, before you move on to oils, cause that's a big one. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of people, and I, I have literally had this battle within myself, right? Like. Olive oil. I used to take shots of it. You know, there's Dr. Stephen Gundry. People say, oh, yeah. drink olive oil, the Mediterranean di diet, you know, olive yeah. oil. But then I hear like some plant-based doctors say, no, it, it damages your epithelial cells. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should just eat the actual olives instead yeah. of the olive oil. Yeah. And the, the thing is, is that it's really the heating process. Hmm that makes the oil damaging because most of the time we're heating the oil. Mm. And so now you've taken something out of its natural place and now you've added a massive amount of heat to it. It mm. denatures the nature of the, the food source mm. itself. Mm. And so that's what then makes it very dangerous. Mm. Like okay. when you think about like hydrogenated oils, yeah. we all know that they're very dangerous. Mm. There's a process by which they go through to become hydrogenated, like the old Crisco oil that they mm. used to eat back in the day. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, also heat is very damaging yeah. to, I mean, just think about it. Food is us. Hmm. Like it becomes us. That's why they say you are what you eat. you eat. Well, if we were to put ourselves on fire, it would denature, huh. Huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what we are. Mm. And so when you put oil on fire in that way and you overcook your food, mm. it becomes something that is that has gone from something that is healing to mm. now something that could be potentially damaging to you. Mm. And it does damage the endothelial layer, that inner layer inside of your blood vessels. Mm. And we have over 16,000 miles of blood vessels. And Say so 16,000 miles of blood vessels wow. in our bodies. Wow. That's the the length that our, our bodies is like recirculating and circulating mm. blood just to mm. get nutrients in our immune system every place in our bodies. Mm. And so when you start to damage those highways, then some of these highways get blocked. Some of these highways get, you know, bumpy, mm. you know, and it starts to cause issues. So, mm. Okay. Yeah. So I want to get into how can we clean the highways. Mm -hmm. But Okay. So that's, I'll say oils is number one that yeah. we should not be consuming. What's number two? Number two and uh, is flour. White flour. Mm -hmm. We eat about 135 pounds of white flour every year. Wow. 
the unfortunate thing about white flour <laughs> is that it's been processed, it's been refined. Mm -hmm. And so when it goes into the body in whatever form, whether it's cookie, cakes, pies, pastas, et cetera, mm -hmm. when it goes into the body, it raises the blood sugar, which causes the insulin levels to raise, mm -hmm. which is now triggering eventually insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And insulin resistance is really the issue when it comes to not only things like high blood pressure and diabetes mm -hmm. and heart disease, but it's also the issue when it comes to cancer as well, too. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times what people are trying to address are the symptoms, mm. but the real cause is the insulin resistance because insulin is a hormone. And so hormones tell our bodies what to do. And one of the things that insulin tells our body to do is, is A, store fat. Mm. So now you're going to be overweight and you look at the American population, 75% of the American population is either overweight or obese. Mm. Okay. Wow. The wow. other thing that it tells the body to do is grow. Okay, and that's a good thing if you want to build muscle, huh. but it's a bad thing if you potentially have a small piece of cancer in yeah. you. And so it tells cancer cells to grow too. So that's the main issue that I'm seeing is with the flour. We're eating far too much flour today. Mm. Okay, so okay. that's number two. All right, so go back a little. So now I change. I want to change my question a bit. So we name the food that we don't want. Can we give an alternative as well? So the olive yeah. oil, what would you say an alternative, yeah. healthy Eat the food from what you came from. Okay, okay, okay. It's always, it, what you're going to always do is reverse engineer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's okay. like, eat the avocado. Eat the avocado. You know? Eat the olive. And you know yeah. what's funny is, eat olives. Mm -hmm. You know, but what I would say is like, I went to Greece one time, mm -hmm. and when I was in Greece, I saw an olive tree. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm going to try, let me try actual olive off the tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever did that? No. They tell us horrible. Okay. They have to be soaked for like two years yeah, okay. in water, in salt for them to actually be edible. Wow. And most people don't know that, but they're still healthy for us. So like eat the olive. Wow. What about like cooking? Like if people cook with oils, like should they cook with something else? Like I remember I got into cooking instead of like butter, I would use ghee. Mm -hmm. Are there any, some people cook with olive oil. I know yeah. there's a heat point, but what, as far as cooking, what would you suggest? I always tell people, so first of all, let me sort of clarify. I'm, I don't eat any animal products. Mm -hmm. So no ghee, no meat, no mm -hmm. dairy, no things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But what I tell people is, for the most part, you want to eat as much food in its original state as mm. possible. So the more raw, the better. Okay. But if you're going to cook your food, yeah. cook it in ways that are very protective as well, too. Steaming your food. Okay. You know, I just think we eat too much fried and too much sauteed food. Mm. It seems like everything has to be either fried or sauteed. Mm. And so I think what people need to do is sort of adjust their plate and say, okay, I can't have but one thing on my plate that has been cooked in oil. Wow. Like that's a step in the right direction. Mm. And I think if people did that, and I would say either eliminate mm. or sparingly eat anything that is ever fried. Because mm. once it's fried, it's done. There's nothing living in it anymore. Mm. And so uh, try to eat fried as either eliminated or as sparingly as possible. Right. But if you're going to use oils, some of the healthier oils are going to be things like avocado oil. Mm. Okay. That's wow. one of the best oils uh, in terms of high temperature oils. Mm. And then oils that you should use, like if you're going to use salads, are things like coconut oil or mm. olive oil. Okay. 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 But because, probably yeah. not. But but probably don't. But if you if you do, this is what yeah, to. Yeah, that's, okay. that's how you do it. Like okay. do it because you have high temperature oils that mm. can actually live through those high temperatures. Mm. And then you have low temperature oils like coconut oil. You'll notice when you cook coconut oil, it mm. starts to brown. Mm. Whenever the oil is browning, it's showing you that it's denatured. It's mm. no longer healthy for you. Mm. Mm, okay. Okay. So next one. So we got oils, mm -hmm. white flour. White flour. The third one is sugar. Sugar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm like surprising my audience because the first thing they were they're thinking I'm going to say is meat. Mm. Than dairy, right? <laughs> and and they those are, mm. you know, because we eat way too much, and I won't go into that because we eat about two hundred pounds of meat every year. But I would say sugar. That's that's a lot. Two hundred pounds of meat. That's a big person. Yeah, a lot of people. If you're eating three meals a day, and most people, this is who I was before I went, you know, plant based thirteen years ago. Mm. I eat meat with every meal. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a meal that I didn't have meat on it. And if mm. it would if it wasn't any meat, I would be like, Where's the meat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a meal. It's not complete. Mm. Yeah. It's sugar. Sugar over instead of meat. You pick well, sugar. Well, you're telling me the most I'm telling you the most dangerous yeah. foods. Yeah. 
And really, it's very difficult to do that. Yeah. Because what I really should have is five, and I should say, I would then have meat and dairy. Okay, gotcha. You gotcha. see what I'm saying? But I'm telling you the foods that automatically lead to disease. Now, meat is on there because you have so many hormones mm. in the meat that we're consuming today. Mm. What they're feeding the animals is a problem, too, because they're feeding them grains and soy and corn. Mm. This is something that not only, if you go back to the 1950s, because I've been doing my research on farming since I own a farm now. And what I noticed was prior to 1950s, if you were to ask a farmer, can I feed my, you know, animal soy? They would be like, absolutely not. You're going to kill the animal. Oh, interesting. But now it's the primary feed of these animals okay. today is cows, p- pigs, and chickens. Huh. And so now you have to understand why they didn't do that mm. as opposed to why they're doing it today. Okay. And then you start to think about how much, you, know, you just saw the FDA approve clone meat, Really? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. They, they approve cloned, cloned, and, cloned okay. meat. They're making cloned meat now. We already had the genetically modified salmon. Yeah. You already had that in store. So you see, Yeah, I saw a video. You said like the, the GMO salmon were eating the actual salmon, like the non-GMO. They, yeah, they turned yeah. into they like put, predators. They somehow ended up in the same pool. Yeah. And um, the genetically modified salmon started eating the natural salmon. Which is an unnatural act- action for yes. us. Wow. Yeah, so, you know, it's on the list, but you you, you only gave me three. I only gave you three, yeah. And yeah. when I start to look at how people are dying mm. and then how people are creating this ease in their bodies, mm. it's because of the initial metabolic imbalance that they're creating. Mm. And much of that metabolic imbalance is coming from those three things and mm. then also the meat and the dairy as well too got it got yeah. it okay i see you sweating now i I'm think winning. we're at the i'm winning it's a different type of so like you got the bees mine yes. is just like a river like running down, like yeah <laughs> my like my like all right we de- we together <laughs> we together i love it does the perfect diet exist no, no. it doesn't okay yeah because everybody is different like we have the same anatomy but we don't always have the same biochemistry. Mm. If you look at one person and look at their ability to detox, another person's mm. ability to detox is going to be different. Okay. Like their glutathione system may be very different from this person over here. You look at somebody's kidney function over here and looks at somebody else's kidney function over here is very different. Look at somebody's ability to have a bowel movement over here versus yeah. over here is very different. We're all okay. And you look at the constitution of the microbiome mm. for one person versus the other is very different. Mm. So what that means is you have a person over here who can digest just anything you put in there Hmm. because they have a very healthy microbiome. They have a lot of diversity. Interesting. And you look at a person over here who has half the amount of uh, bacterial species in their microbiome over here. Not only can they not consume most of the food that they can consume over here, Mm. but they're also going to have issues with breaking that food down as well, too. Mm. So everybody's diet is going to be a little bit different. Mm. It's so interesting what you said because... the whole idea of the fecal transplant yeah. can change everything. Yep. Can change your whole microbiome to if you get a transplant, I guess, from a healthy subject. Yeah. Put it in, like it can change. It can you could lose weight. You're every yeah. That's so interesting. The bacteria can do that much for for a human being. You want to know why? Why is that? Because when you look at the makeup of the human being, and you're looking at the cells. I mean, we're only really ten percent like human cells. Human cells yeah. Yeah, I heard that. Like in terms of numbers. Mm. So we're mostly bacteria and viruses. Wow. And so when somebody gets a bacterial or viral infection, it's not really because you have a particular bacteria or virus in you. Mm. Is that your constitution is imbalanced. Mm. Okay, so you'll take somebody over here who got exposed to COVID, somebody over here who got exposed to COVID, Mm. saying COVID, this person had absolutely no symptoms. This person had a lot of symptoms. Mm. And it's because this person over here has a microbiome, mm. which is bacteria, mm. that is consistent of enough bacteria that is creating 80% of their immune system. Mm. Okay? This mm. person over here is deficient. Mm. This person over here has the ability to fight off whatever comes their way. Mm. This person doesn't. They don't. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You spent some time in Japan. I did. It was in o- Okinawa? Okinawa. So tell me about what are... Because bl- I... I preach this to people, but I want to hear from you. What are blue zones? And also, what did you learn from living in one? Yeah, so, and I have to make that distinction, Mm. Okinawa, Mm. not Japan, because Okinawa 
is a thousand miles south of Japan. Mm. It is not actually on the island of Japan. Mm. Japan is an island, huge island, but Okinawa is a very small island, a thousand miles south. Mm. And Okinawa is around the equator, which means that it has a climate that is consistent with the Caribbean. Mm. Okay, so that's really important too. It's a, it's really very consistent with Miami weather wow, throughout the whole year. So in Okinawa, it only gets, I mean, the lowest temperature is probably like 65 degrees. Oh my God. That's winter. Why did you come back? What the heck? Like that? Man, I ask myself <laughs> that every day. But um, I learned so much yeah. that when I was learning what I was learning, I was like, I got to bring this back mm. to the people. Mm. So that was one of the primary reasons I came back. Yeah, spent about five years there wow. in Okinawa. Wow. Loved every minute of it. Specifically, what a blue zone is, there's five blue zones around the world. And these are specific regions that have certain characteristics. Mm. And one of the primary characteristics that they have is that they have a group of people who live to 100 the longest. So they had the highest concentrations of those people. Mm. And Okinawa for years led in that category. And people were trying to figure out why, because the mount, the island is only about 30 miles long and about 10 miles wide. Mm. It's not a big island. Interesting. But yet and still, they had one of the largest group of people who would live to 100. Yeah. And so Blue Zones, they all share these characteristics. And some of the characteristics are that they have community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another one of the characteristics is they eat primarily a plant-based diet. Okay. A lot of sweet potato too, right? Yeah. Uh, and so they share a lot of different characteristics that sort of help us understand why these group of people who don't share the same culture, who don't share the same region, who don't know about each other, mm. But they consistently are producing people who not only live to 100, but they're living to 100 with little to no disease as well, too. Wow. And so... Uh, health span. Health span. Mm. True health span, not just lifespan. Mm. That's really what you're finding today is, pe like, on one end, people are living longer, mm. but they're living longer with disease. Mm. So the last 20 years of their life is Alzheimer's, is dementia, it's mm. diabetes and amputations, mm. but that's no way to live. But yeah. the blue zones are very different from that. Mm. They're dying quietly in their sleep. Mm. So that's the difference mm. between the two. They're still biking. They're still in the garden. They're still, some are still sexually active. They're still yeah, they're, they're moving and grooving. I've never, like, what was so inspiring about going to Okinawa and watching these people who are 97 a hundred, a hundred and two, mm. bike, garden, walk up hills, mm -hmm. do exercises, et cetera, have yep. fluid conversations. <laughs> but that was very inspiring. But the biggest inspiring thing was that my grandmother died at 67, mm. okay, of colon cancer. Mm. Her mother, my great grandmother, lived to 105. Wow. And the most inspiring sort of tidbit I, talk, wow. I took away from living there was that that was the difference. Huh. My great grandmother lived like Okinawa. Wow. I just got chills. Wow. Yeah, like she lived like lived on a farm. Mm. There was an outhouse. Mm. There was a well. Mm. So they got the water from the land. Food in the back, the side in the front. Mm. When there was somebody sick, she knew exactly where to go in the woods behind us and grab it. Mm. Or it was in the garden. So she really lived like the Okinawans lived. Mm. Drink herbal teas. <laughs> you know, made all her food from scratch. Mm. And we just got so far away from it that we traded it all in for modern conveniences. You know, when it comes to food, when it comes to microwaving, when it comes to throwing away these herbal remedies and now taking over-the-counter uh, prescriptions and mm. drugs mm. in order to heal. So we just threw away the old traditions, mm. traded them in for the modern conveniences. But all of them are just simply treating the symptoms, not addressing the cause. Wow. And none of them are actually nutritious to us, mm. you know, mm. and so we end up deficient and we end up sick. Mm. You brought up a good point to the conveniences, and I preach this all the time. You should deconvenience your life as much as you can. Like I tell people, don't take the elevators. Don't, you know, I'll, we spend a lot of times at airports. So, you know, the, the little walking slide that makes you go faster. Yeah. You know, I'm like, don't take that. Just walk. Yeah. Go, take the steps. Take the stairs, right? Yep. It's, it's part farther away farther instead of away. driving around yeah. 10 times to find yeah. a parking space up close. That's it. That's and it. getting in an argument with somebody 
nobody about it. People do that at the gym. That's what. That's the crazy part. Like yeah. they try to find the closest <laughs> spot and to go and work out. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, fu- it's funny how unaware we can be sometimes. But the one thing I wanted to mention about the the Okinawans that you said is they're walking uphill. They're walking throughout the day. Yep. And apparently, and you probably know this better than anybody. If you work out, a lot of people do, they work out an hour in the gym. But if you sit for the rest of the day or pretty much for the rest of the day, your heart, your likelihood of heart disease is the same as somebody who yeah. doesn't work out you at all. You threw the workout out the window. Out the window. Yeah. So it's like move throughout the day, not just a, a an hour. Yeah. Move throughout. We're made to move. Like in life itself, it's constant movement. And we're mm. when we're stagnant. Mm. In our life, mm. it can impact our life. It can impact our physical abilities. It can impact our cognitive abilities. Mm. It can make us depressed. So just think about what happens when you don't physically move, <laughs> when you have the opportunity. I tell people all the time, like, when they're unmotivated and uninspired, mm. move. Move. Yep. You know, at least if you can't figure out what direction you want to go in in your life, at least you can move. <laughs> and through movement, you can sort of st- stimulate thought mm. and be become inspired that way. But, yeah, we're not moving today. That's it. You know, we leave our, our homes in the morning. We jump into a car. We drive, get to work, go straight from the parking deck to an elevator <laughs> and sit down in a cubicle for eight hours. Convenience. And then we wonder why we're... Our bones are breaking down, our bones are brittle, our muscles are tight, you know, and we feel stagnant. You know, our life physically is stagnant, so it's going to be also stagnant in reality as well, too. Mm, well said. Well, let's let's move. Uh, we're in this sauna. Let's move out of this sauna. Let's do it. this heat. Let's get some hydration. Yes, sir. And can continue the conversation. Let's do it. Welcome back. How was the sauna for you? Man, I survived it. I don't think, who won that? I, don't, I won. You think? I won. I get yeah. that. I get. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder why I won? Why did you? Win? First of all, I do the sauna, and there's a because especially infrared because there's a lot of benefits from it, mm-hmm. which we probably can talk about in a second. But typically, when I go in the sauna, I know I'm gonna sweat. Yeah, I go in there. I know I'm not gonna be talking to anybody. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. probably gonna be meditating. Yeah. And so to do an interview with yeah. anyone, yeah. I'm like, all right, I gotta talk. Yep, brains going. <laughs> and I'm just a I'm I'm a sweater too. Yeah. So I think together we probably get like maybe a gallon of water. Oh like yeah. A sweat kind of came out <laughs> combined. Yeah, it was it was a lot. Yeah. It was a good competition <laughs> it was, though. Yeah, it was. It was good. <laughs> so we left off and we talked about blue zones, Okinawa, yeah, and centenarians, people who live over 100. Do you think this is kind of a fun question. Do you think humans will ever be ever live 150 to 200 years old? I think it's very possible. Yeah. Is it a diet thing? Is it a technology thing? Is it? I think it's a combination of, of both. Mm. But I think the way we think about technology today versus how it works in nature. Nature is technology. I mean, our bodies are literally a pharmacy. I mean, you want to be happy. Your body creates serotonin. You know, you want to feel rewarded, it creates dopamine. You understand? So, and if you want to sort of feel euphoric, it creates these opium-like compounds. So our bodies are literally the greatest pharmacy and greatest technology we could ever have. We just don't understand how to tap into it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that our perception of human history is that we evolved from this very primitive species. But I I also believe that, it's not that I believe, there's been five catastrophic events Mm -hmm. that have happened that have ended life as we know it on this planet and it restarted. And I think our beginning was that we did understand those type of things. And I think the ancestors that, our ancestors that built the pyramids and the things that have happened in the Mayan k- kingdom and things of that nature, I think they were very well tapped into mm-hmm. that type of not only biotechnology, but understanding of ourselves as spiritual beings as well, too. And I think if humans get to a place where we're not as violent mm-hmm. and we get to a place where we're not as greedy, mm-hmm. we'll be able to tap back into those things once again. And we can experience life as a 200-year-old. Mm-hmm. But I also believe that this is really spiritual beings having a human experience. So we're not really here to live 200 years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need to take different forms as human beings. And so to take a different form, you have to let the old form die. So it's 
kind of complicated. Mm, well said. Well said. Dr. Bobby Price, you, you did a video or you were in a, it was an interview and you kind of broke the internet when you said you don't wear deodorant. <laughs> 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 and, it's, it, and it's interesting because like, I don't wear it all the time. If I do wear, it's like stuff with a few ingredients. I got into like making my own deodorant. It, it worked okay. It's, you know, it's a bit of a hassle. But I do, I do like, uh, oh man, it's funny. The same Dr. Teal that is in our foot bath. So we're in like a foot bath with like Epsom salt. Yeah. They make this deodorant with a few ingredients. So I use that from time to time. But you don't use any at all. Nah. Ever. Nah. nah. Why? Well, first of all, because <laughs> I know people out there are like, man, he must be musty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, like- uh, You don't was, smell. No, you don't. You don't. No. Yeah. And so like, it was really serendipitous. Mm. What happened was, as I was telling you earlier, I went, I shifted my diet completely about 12, 13 years ago. I uh, went completely plant-based there, went raw, did a lot of fasting, and I lost a lot of weight. I mean, I lost initially 45 pounds, but at some point of the fasting, because I did like a 21-day water fast, I did a lot of stuff to cleanse and heal my body. I did my detox that most people know me for now. So I did a full body detox, and I literally went from weighing about 248 pounds to weighing, I think, 180 pounds. Now, that's a huge shift. And I'm not a small guy, like I'm 6'2". And so go down to 180 pounds, which was like my 10th grade year playing weight, but felt the most amazing I've ever felt in my life. What I noticed was when I got down to that weight and I started doing traveling, I had shifted all of my cosmetic products, hygienic products. And so I, I couldn't get my deodorant while I was on the road and I ran out of it. And I think I was in Africa at the time, and I just said, well, I'm not going to buy this trash and put that on it. It's got aluminum in it. Mm. So I just said, that, uh, well, I'm just going to have to be musty. Mm. And I just didn't wear deodorant for like a month, and I was like sleep one day. And I was like, I'm surprised I don't smell. Yeah. And then I just kept not wearing it and noticing that I didn't have an odor. And the girl that I was dating at the time was like, yo, can you mm. verify this for me? Because sometimes <laughs> you can't smell yourself. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, I was noticing that. Like, I don't see you wear deodorant anymore. I don't see it under your arms and I never smell you. And I was like, yeah, it's interesting. And for a period, I started to put limes because you can use limes. That you cut limes off and oh, yeah. rub limes under your, huh. your underarms as well for deodorant. I was using that, but then I was just like, well, if she don't smell me, I don't smell me, Yeah. then I must be good. So yeah. out with the deodorant. Uh -huh. So when I said it all in the interview, man, the comments were wild, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like wild. It's a big one, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but you know, I was explaining that to like my membership program because they were like, wait, Dr. Price, you don't wear deodorant? And I was like, nah, and I was explaining it to them. And then I was helping them understand like, you have a lymphatic system. And your lymphatic system is in the folds of your body, under your arm, in your neck, in your groin, in your abdomen, et cetera. And your lymphatic system has these lymph nodes in them. And these lymph nodes are like toilet stools. They just dump waste out, okay? And so what happens is, is that when you wear traditional deodorant that has antiperspirant in it, so you don't perspire, and a lot of our waste comes out through our sweat, then guess what? You're not dumping waste out of the body. So it makes sense why people start to accumulate waste. You see what I'm saying? So you're blocking the waste with the aluminum and the other, other things that block the sweat. And now you're accumulating waste in the body and waste smells bad. Mm. And I do a lot of things to eliminate waste in, in terms of like my detox, infrared sauna, et cetera. Mm. It's interesting because what you're saying is so indicative of our culture of we go for the symptoms as opposed yeah. to the root. We have been brainwashed to need the all these deodorants, to the perfumes, you know, the, the colognes. Yeah, what you're masking the odor. Man, just masking it. Deodorant, <laughs> masking the odor. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating because I saw some of the comments and I'm glad that you have and are continuing to educate people about the root cause of some of these issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you see, like even now, I'm out of the sauna, still sweating. Mm -hmm. But as I was telling you before, like I'm always on planes. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on a plane for trip for like 30 hours to get back to the States, you know, on a plane trip here, four or five hours to get here. That's radiation. 
So I still have to do detoxification for myself. And my body already has these detoxification mechanisms, but you got to understand there's elimination pathways. And one of the primary elimination pathways is through the skin. We sweat. And so when we eliminate waste from the body, and, and it's not just waste that you think about like poo and pee, but it's also radiation. It's also heavy metals. They come out through the sweat. Mm. And sometimes we're getting radiation and chemicals in the air that we don't know about. Mm. So my body is always ready to get rid of something. So when I sweat, I just let myself sweat. Mm. So when we sweat, we sweat out some of the toxins, the radiations, but we also sweat out important minerals. Yeah. Let's talk about rehydration because we just left the sauna. How important is hydration? What kind of water should people be drinking and how much of it? First of all, it's very important for people to know and understand the primary we should be primary way we should be hydrating is through our food. Like you should be eating hydrating foods. Wow. Because when you think about it, when you make juices with cucumbers and fruits and other types of vegetables and green leafy vegetables, et cetera, they create water. And now that is structured water. That's water that has a structure to it. That's water that has minerals, vitamins, et cetera, to it. But when you're drinking most typical water, it doesn't have anything in it in, in terms of health, but it has a lot of things that are unhealthy. So when you test the like natural tap water, Natural tap water is, well, I won't call it natural, but tap water is going to have bacteria in it. It's going to have some pharmaceuticals, particles in it. It's going to have chlorine in it. It's going to have fluoride in it. It's going to have a ton of things that are going to be very toxic to your body. So the primary way that we should be hydrating first is through our foods. And the example I always give people is when you eat a raisin, your body literally has to take that raisin and convert it back into a grape. So it can be hydrated because otherwise it can't break it down when it's in this dried state, no hydration in it. And just think about our bodies. Our bodies are roughly 70 to 80 percent water. And so when we're putting things in our body that are dehydrating us, coffee, nicotine, the list goes on and on and on, dehydrating foods, we're dehydrating ourselves. We're putting ourselves in a state of emergency because that's the number one thing after oxygen that we need. The number one nutrient is oxygen. Three to four minutes without that, life ceases to exist. Mm. The number one nutrient after that is hydration, H2O. So if you don't have water in your body, you're going to cease to exist. It's going to create low blood pressure. It can create high blood pressure. It can create other issues as well, constipation, on and on. So you got to hydrate with your foods first. Okay. And then after that, my primary hydration is coconut water. Okay. Um, we have about 200 coconut trees on the farm. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah, I'm gonna take some <laughs> coconut water right yeah, now. So we have about 200 trees on the farm. So, you know, I'm hydrating with the coconuts. And the reason why coconuts are the perfect sort of solution, pun intended, is because, you know, at the end of the, end of the day, coconut water is a perfect water. It's inside of the coconut. It's protected from any kind of impurities. The second thing is, is that it's flooded with nutrients. It's flooded with not only the minerals that you need, because that's what makes water alkaline, the minerals. So when you're buying alkaline water, what makes it the pH go up is the minerals, the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium. That's what increases the pH of it. Okay. Now, the unfortunate thing is most people are buying alkalized water. Alkalized water is when they take tap water, and add synthetic minerals to it that don't come from nature. But when you use coconut water, those minerals came from nature. And so that's why coconut water is great for that reason, but it also has healthy sugars, healthy fats as well too. So that's why it's a perfect solution to the hydration problem. Wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. So how much spring water do you drink or is... So then I hydrate probably with two liters of spring water every day. Okay. Yeah, two to three liters. Now, the the I think the the going equation that they I usually give people is half your body weight in ounces. Mm -hmm. And so if I weigh 200 pounds, 100 ounces a day, which is roughly three liters. But I, I'm also taking other things into account. I'm taking into account we were just in the sauna, so I need more. Yep. I'm taking into account did I have a lot of fruits today, which I did. I'm taking into account did I have some green juice or juices today, which I did. 
those things are going into that equation too. Mm, awesome. Let's talk about food labels. I feel like this is something that we should have learned in school, how to read. <laughs> we learn how to read, but we, <laughs> we, we look at, we don't ever turn around the package of food if we, you know, some people say we shouldn't even eat food in packages, but a lot of it always has a package on it, a code, even the fruits. What are some things that people need to know about food labels that you could share with us? I would say, man, when I think about how scary food is now, I just think people don't understand how scary food is now. Mm. Because then the reason why is because how we're defining food. Like if you go into the supermarket today, probably 80% of the foods that are in the supermarket today did not exist 50, 60 years ago. Like you couldn't walk in a market, a supermarket, maybe 60 years ago because supermarkets are a really new concept. So like say for instance, my great grandmother, if she wanted meat, she either had to have that animal on the farm or go to a butcher. You know, butchers are non virtually non-existent today. So it's important to know and understand that most of the foods in the supermarket are products, not food. And there's a difference between products and foods. Wow. Okay. Because foods are one ingredient, avocado, kale, a tomato, a sarasat fruit, like it's one ingredient. Okay. That's food. Uh -huh. Food products are a combination of not only food stuffs, but also the chemicals and our preservatives and the thickening agents and the dyes and the emulsifiers that they put in those foods to keep the shelf life. That's a product, okay? So most of what people are eating are food products. And so that's, that's the very most important concept that people need to get down when they walk into a grocery store. The other thing that's important is that, you know, I have a unique perspective because, you know, I was a chemistry major. I was also a, a pharmacist, a clinical pharmacist in a hospital. So when I look at the food label and all of those words that sound like chemistry, I know exactly what they are. I know that some of them are not only in foods, but they're also in paint thinner. Oh my and God. And some of them are also in the same antifreeze that you put in your radiator. And so when I see the words, I know what they mean. And generally speaking, most people just aren't gonna know what they mean. So the general sort of advice that I give people is that if you can't pronounce it or it sounds like chemistry, you probably shouldn't eat it. Mm. <laughs> it's a good rule. You know, and then the other general rule that I give people is that if it has more than five ingredients, it's probably not a good choice as well, too. And then the other rule that I give people is that when they when you see the list of ingredients, typically go from the highest concentration to the lowest concentration, meaning that that first ingredient is what is the highest concentration, the most of what's in there. So if you're buying spaghetti sauce and the first ingredient isn't tomatoes, then it probably stands to think that this is probably not a good <laughs> product, <laughs> you know? So like, that's really important. Wow. wow. And then uh, of course it becomes very complicated when you're looking at the serving sizes because sometimes you go and it'll say, this only has five sugars, but it will have 24 servings. So then you gotta multiply that five grams of sugar by 24 and that's how much total sugar you're consuming. That's how much much total sodium, a salt that you're consuming. Mm. And it's important to know that that sodium is very different from the natural salt like pink Himalayan salt. So those are just a few rules. That's great. That that's I saw you need to know. I mean, that's, that's the, that foundation is, that'll save lives right yeah. there. Yeah, that's <laughs> shift everything in, on your grocery shopping trip. Awesome. Let's talk about your new book. What made you want to write it? Because it's different from it's different. things that you've kind of kind of written about in the past. Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So my first book was Vegication Over Medication, which was a dope experience because it's essentially me living in Japan and all the knowledge I learned while I lived in Okinawa, Bloom Zone, and then traveling around the world, all the knowledge I got from herbalists, shamans, spiritual gurus, that th sort of thing to help people understand how to use food as medicine. And I was writing a whole nother book. Like the second book was going to be about how food is literally being used to keep us addicted and to literally poison us. I was trying to write that book, but I kept getting writer's block. And whenever I get writer's block, I usually do something creative in the meantime so that I can kind of get stimulated. And I started writing the new book, which is Life is My Guru. And so um, I always, always had this concept that as I was traveling around the world, I went to like maybe... 37 countries in a span of like 
a year and a half. Wow. So I was really, really traveling a lot. And during that time, it was really a spiritual adventure. I was going different places like Bali. I went to Bali to meet Katut, who was the man who was in the movie Eat, Pray, Love. Mm. Oh, in wow. Bali. And I actually got to meet him. Wow. He's a ba- he was a he was a Balinese healer, like a real Balinese, but I got to meet the actual Katut. Wow. You know, as I'm traveling and having these experiences, which were really some very spiritual experiences, I'm learning lessons. And not only lessons about my present life, but lessons about my past life as well, too. It's helping me understand life in a different way. Hmm. And so what I realized was that as I was in this space and time, I wrote the, I finished the book last year. As I was in this space and time that we're in and we're transitioning from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, hmm. and there's a human shift in consciousness that is happening, hmm. what I realized was it was becoming very easy for me to write this new book, Life is My Guru, where I was going to be sharing with people how I was pulling wisdom out of my life to help me understand what God or source was trying to sort of nudge me in the direction of my own personal evolution. I figured that considering where we're at in the space and time and the madness that is occurring in the world and what people really need is understanding what is happening. You know, what, why is this happening to me? Because most people have this perspective about life, that life is happening to me instead of happening for me. And I thought it would be an amazing book for people to shift how they look at life so that then they can understand why it's so important that they take care of the most valuable asset that they have in this life experience, which is their human body. Because that's the whole purpose of this. As spiritual beings, we're supposed to be having a human experience And through this human experience, we come into the body to experience limitation because the spirit is limitless. It it doesn't know anything about anger, hate, bitterness. It doesn't know anything about what it can't manifest. It's limitless. And so we come into this human form to experience limitation through these five to six senses that we have. You understand? And so... Why come, do you think that is? Why does the the spirit or source want to experience limitation? Well, you have to understand when you have this, this boundless, this is how I do it with people. Draw a circle, okay? All right? And draw a point in the middle. You draw a, a line to any point on the outside, and you draw a line here diagonally. You walk out to that point of the circle, and you get to see a whole new perspective on life. Okay, you draw a line in the opposite direction at the end of that circle. You walk out to that end, you get to see a whole new perspective of life. And so what happens is when you get narrowed in your perspective, you get to see the parts of you that aren't healed. Okay, so as a spiritual being, you have to understand that we're one of many. And what I mean by that is when you think about the spirit, we're just one piece of God one piece of source. It's the same thing with the human body. We have individual cells. Now, one cell can decide to go rogue and that cell will become cancerous, okay? And it will start to kill you, one cell. And so what happens is you'll have this whole body of a spiritual being that we call God or call source, and we'll be that one point, that one cell. But within that one cell that can experience every cell next to it, Okay, you can experience all the trillions of cells in this one body that we call God or source. But the thing it can experience is itself. Okay, and so to experience yourself or the parts of yourself that are unhealed, you've come into limitation. And now you can not only see it, it's very apparent because now you only have six senses instead of, instead of being a multisensory individual. Mm. Okay, so that's why we come into limitation. Mm. And so that's what I felt like we needed right now. And so that's what I felt like God led me to do. God led me to write this book because it was so easy. Mm. You know, like (laughs) the other book was so hard. Really? And now that I'm writing the other book, it's flowing. Hmm. And so I just decided to be obedient to that calling and say, you know what? This is the work that needs to be done. So I'm going to do do this book because it's so important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I I applaud you you being able to follow that call. And I, I agree with you. You know, I think when we talk about a hum- the human experience, we break it down into mind, body, spirit. And I think sometimes we neglect the spiritual side for the worldly. 
Yep. I think it's, it's so easy because the world is full of distraction and we never can turn inward. But by turning inward, we find a piece of power. We find that we are love incarnated into this form. And that will also allow us to come into more balance with the other, with the mind, with the body. Because we're so disconnected. And this is why people have anxiety attacks. Mm. And usually when people have an anxiety attack, there's nothing to have anxiety about. It just happens. Mm. And so what they're saying is that the mind is disconnected from the body because the body experiences the attack. The mind is trying to figure out why the hell this is happening. Mm. So the body has become disconnected from the mind. And so because we're so disconnected, that's why our bodies are also dysfunctioning and we label it as dis-ease. But that's a perfect name for it too. Mm. This is a prefix that means to take away and ease is peace. So we're taking away our peace. <laughs> Brilliant. Dr. Bobby Price, I want to play a quick game. All right, let's do this it. This is uh, it's, it's kind of a rapid fire game. It's called the five best. What's the best advice you ever got? Best advice I ever got, live in your own authentic power. That's the best advice bar none I ever got. And part of that advice came through life experience. The other part came through people constantly showing me that. And then the other part of that came through the book, The Alchemist. That really inspired me to live my life unapologetically. And um, when I tell you, like, I love people. I care, I care immensely about people. That's why I do what I do. Yeah. But when it comes to opinions, I don't care. Mm. I think that's my superpower. That when people give me a compliment, it rolls off of me in the same direction that when people try to offend me. I'm thankful for all my blessings. But what I realize is that my approval, my validation has to come from me and come from God and nowhere else. Reminds me of that Rudyard your Kipling poem. If, yeah. If. Praise oh. and blame. Those uh, two imposters, right? Yeah. Treat those two imposters <laughs> the same. The same. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> you um, keep your head when all about you is losing theirs and blaming it on you. Mm -hmm. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, mm -hmm. make a room for their, their doubts too. Mm. Man, that's a beautiful poem. That's great. Yeah. yeah. What's the best investment you ever made? Best investment myself, man. When I tell you, so like right before like the whole real estate burst, I was in real estate. Okay, I had bought like ten houses, and I saw the burst coming before. Because what happened was, I had a friend. I had taught him how to get into real estate. He started before I did, and what happened was, he was like, "Yo, my payments just went through the roof." What happened? I was like, and he was like, you need to help me. You told me. I'm like, what I need? I didn't do the loan for you. Mm, mm. I was like, but I look at the paperwork. I'm looking at the paperwork and I'm like, oh, they say it's an adjustable rate mortgage. So it's supposed to go up. And so I was like, it's time for them all to go up. And he had like five houses and the, the, all the payments went up like $1,000 each. And he hadn't been saving money. So he was essentially about to go bankrupt. And so I saw that. And I, you know, started to sell off my houses. But what I learned from that after that experience, I remember my girlfriend at the time, you know, she was like, how do you feel like, you know, now you had all these houses and now they're gone. And one of them got foreclosed on. And I'll tell you about that one in a second. But she was like, that failure must be really painful. I was like, I was like, I didn't fail. You know, like, and I think I talk about this in the book, but right before that, like right before I bought my first house, six months before that, I was homeless, sleeping in my car in the winter. And I was like, I went to work. Like I worked at night. I worked during the day. You know, I took a, ba a shower at the gym. Like I taught myself so much during that process. And a year later, I had my own house. And then uh, two years later, I had like 10 houses. I went from no house to 10 houses in two years. I was like, the greatest thing I learned through that process was that I won. Like I need, I taught myself a skill that allowed me to not only put so much money in my pocket that I could buy a home, but I remember going into the bank and I had, I, the, I gave, the lady saw how much money I had. She was like, I really need to learn what you're doing. Mm. And I was like, I just thought this skill up. You know, I learned the skill. I perfected the skill. And I was like, this is how you manifest in life. 
And you eventually elevate that because now you don't need anything physical mm -hmm. to create anymore. So it elevates. But that house that foreclosed on, it was with a bank who got dissolved because they were creating so much mortgage fraud that even that foreclosure fell off my credit. Wow. I was explaining to her, I was like, man, what I, I learned that, you know, I was chasing out the money and I never could get it. I was like, through that process, I learned I am the money. Like, I have to cultivate me, not anything else. And this is a point that I had graduated school and, you know, but I learned that I am the money. And so mm -hmm. self-investment is the best investment. It's awesome. Love that. I know you're a reader. What would you say the best book you ever read? Damn, that's tough, bro. I'm one of the best. Well, I mentioned one, The Alchemist. That's definitely, without a doubt, one of my favorite. I would say, can I name a couple? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Let's get a couple. That's easy. Seed of the Soul. Okay. Powerful. Gary, Gary Zukov. Zukov. Yeah. Seed of the Soul is amazing. I would also say The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart, yep. There's one more. One more. I'll say The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Classic. <laughs> Best quote. You ever heard? I always flub this up, and it's my favorite quote. I don't, I don't know how I do it. It's by Muhammad Ali. Okay. He says, the man who thinks the same at 50, the same way he has that he thought at 30, has wasted 20 years of his life. You know, and I grew up in a very impoverished neighborhood. And when you grow up that way, there's a certain guilt that you feel from liberating yourself from the environment. I'll talk about that in the book a little bit too. And, you know, one of the constant things that I would feel like my friends, when I would go back, they would be gauging me mm. to like, see, like, he's the same person or you got all these degrees now. And like, they'd be gauging me. Most of the friends would be like, damn, you're the same dude. Just, just did your thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, every now and then I had that friend like, man, you're different now. Mm, yeah. And I would always say to them, I was like, I would be upset if I wasn't. That's it. I was like, you know, they would try to make me feel guilty about it, but I always say, shame, shame on me for changing? No, shame on you for remaining the same. That's it. That's a Jay-Z quote, man. People look at you strange and say you changed, huh? Mm -hmm. Like I worked this hard to stay the same? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Last one. When's the best time in your life? When was the best time? I'm trying to liberate myself of that concept. Awesome. So the power of now, right? Man, those moments that I was traveling for that year and a half, and I thought like the whole journey was about going all these places to study with healers and shamans and spiritual gurus and spend time in India learning yoga and meditation and, and going to Africa and having that experience, spending time there and traveling to multiple countries. I thought that was about healing other people. It was about healing me. Mm. That bar none was the best time of my life. You know, that, that I, I didn't have cell phone service. I only worked off Wi-Fi. Wow. It was just me and the world and different cultures and, and adjusting and learning and experiencing myself in different ways. And yeah, it was profound. And so that's why I write about that a lot in the book, because I think that's what people aren't getting in life. They're not getting the opportunity to see how profound life is, yeah. but also how profound they are in the whole experience of life, you know? Yeah, we, we miss it, right? We miss we, the whole miss picture. That, yeah. yeah. Last question. If I gave you a magic wand and I said, you could point this magic wand at the earth and make a wish, and tomorrow when you woke up, that magic wand wish will be granted. Yeah. What would your magic wand wish be? To give everyone self-mastery. Because that's why we're where we are right now in this human experience. Is because we've been cheated out of our ability to be to think freely. We've been coached into being addicted to certain things, food, drugs, etc. Our own toxicity, others' toxicity. Self-mastery is what I would point and say, give everybody self-mastery. Now we have free thinkers, critical thinkers. Now we have people who not only think for themselves, but they think for others. Mm. And now people can truly tap into that which is divine within them. Mm. 
That's what I would, yeah, without a doubt. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Where can people follow your work? Where can people get the book? Yeah. So you can follow my work on Instagram, Dr. Holistic, completely spelled I like that out. name, Dr. Holistic. I love that. Yeah. On YouTube, I do a lot of work on YouTube. So it's just Dr. Bobby Price. I put a lot of content there. As well as go to my website, drbobbyprice.com. You can get the book. You can get my detox and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, man, I would love to stay connected with those who resonate with me. Mm. I feel like we all have a tribe. Mm. And we all made this agreement before we even came in human form to say, yo, when I go down there, I'm going to need to check in with you on this part of my journey. Mm. And I believe that not only will I be valuable to you, but I'll, you'll also be valued, valuable to me in that experience too. Amazing. Yeah. Dr. Bobby Price, thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you for coming on Sauna Sessions. It yeah, was yeah. such a delight to finally connect Indeed. with you and Indeed. Share, share these jewels of wisdom that you have. Yeah, I appreciate you, brother. Mm. Appreciate you. Peace, bro.